happy to be here today and happy to be with you. And um, we're, what we're really kind of waiting on is for, for some expectancy to arrive. just not a lot of expectancy curiosity is not expectancy curiosity is not expectancy I'm just kind of waiting for some expectation to arrive why because it's impossible to assemble with the body of Christ with faith and as an act of faith if you don't come with expectancy. Faith produces expectation. No expectation, no faith. Uh, there's a lot of folks that commit sin when they go to church. Because the Bible says what's not so ever of faith is sin. Whatever's not of faith is sin. And since faith produces expectancy, when I come together with the body of Christ without expectancy, I've come together without faith. And whatever's done without faith is sin. So if I come to the, together with the body of Christ and I come without expectancy, I come just going through the motions, putting in my time, fulfilling some kind of religious obligation, and that is a stench in the nostrils of God. I could say it stronger than that, but that's strong enough. If you look up the word religion in the Bible, you will find that it's never spoken of positively. It is not a positive biblical word. It's not. The only time the word is used positively is in James chapter 1. And for us to know it was positive, he had to put a positive adjective with it. Pure religion and undefiled uh, can't believe I can't quote it. Uh, whoever's on there, put up James chapter 1, 27. I can remember the text. Pure religion and undefiled. I started, it didn't sound right. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So if you want to practice a religion God expects and accepts, you have to be involved with ministering to widows and the fatherless and to be living a life that is above sin. That's the only religion God accepts. So if your religion is just coming and going to church, it's not a pure religion. It's not wrong to come to church, but when we come to church without expectancy, we come to church without faith. You see, and I've already talked to God about this. He's already talked to me about this service. I know what he wants to do here today. I know with everything in me that there are people going to leave this service different than they came in. I know that. But God cannot force that on anybody. God can't force that on anybody. And of course, the problem with having the Holy Ghost is you hear stuff, see. And somebody said, well, what if I don't want to leave here different? Oh, I'm aware. I'm aware of that. I'm aware that there are people after 52 or almost 53 years in the ministry, I'm very well aware there are people that don't want to change. They don't want to, don't want to be different. Don't fear. You want to leave here exactly like you came in? God's not touching that. 
You got it. But understand that the consequences of that choice are on you too. Not on God, not on the preacher, not on the church. The consequences of choosing to leave here like you came is on you. And there's no blessing from God on that. I didn't even realize, oh, the Lord is so amazing. He gave me a bunch of verses this morning during my prayer time, and I didn't think there was any way I was going to use these verses. How about Jeremiah 17 and verse 5? Please. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man or in flesh, and maketh flesh his arm or his strength, his source, his ability, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Notice what this verse is saying. If I'm trusting men or even self rather than trusting God, my heart has departed from God. I can come and sit on a church seat. Be, I can be the first one there and the last one to leave. And my heart having departed from God because I'm trusting me, my wisdom, my ability, and not God. What's the curse? Next verse. For he shall be like the heath or the heat in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Not only will there not be anything to drink spiritually in that place, but there will be, there will be a sense of emptiness and aloneness. That is the consequence of trusting self and not God. Next verse. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Next verse. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters. And that spreadeth out her roots by the river. And shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year or not be full of care in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Big difference, isn't it? Big difference. You know, we live in a world where our culture is defined to decided to redefine terms according to it what pleases it. There's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. The consequence is God is a God of truth, and he's the one that determines what words really mean. And we can change the definition of words to excuse ourselves. We can do that. Or we can accept the definitions that God has for his. You say, God, how does God define words? But when you read the Bible, you'll see how the word of God uses certain words. And the scripture gives us the meaning just by the way they're used. And if we apply the world's definition to those words, it totally perverts and distorts the scripture. And Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And in our world, there are so many truths. So called. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. I realize that in this current culture, when I make the statement that I believe that verse with all of my being, that the Lord Jesus Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life, I automatically declare that I'm against the current climate and culture which believes that everybody's going to the same place. And it doesn't matter what route or road they travel to get there. I have to decide, you have to decide, whether I'm going to believe what the culture says is the way it ought to be or, or what God and his word says. I believe the Bible, so shoot me. 
And it may happen someday. I believe the Bible. I don't prefer any human being over the Bible. I don't prefer anything the culture says over the Bible. I believe the Bible. You know, this current culture has been just really gotten steam going about 10, 15 years at the most. The Bible's been around for a couple of thousand years. I think I'll trust it. Man's tried to destroy it, eliminate it, and we've got it today in more versions than you can imagine. The scripture says of the crucifixion that if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They thought they were winning when they crucified him and didn't realize that was the greatest mistake they ever made. If they'd have just left the Bible alone, it's possible it would have gone away through indifference. But because they fought it, you, you, you don't understand that a couple of centuries ago, three or four centuries ago, it was at a capital offense to have a Bible in the language other than the one the church approved. And if you translated the Bible into the language of the common man, you could get burned at the stake. Read your history. And now the most printed Bible in the world is the Bible printed in English. It's a choice, see. You and I have a choice. You can leave here different. What difference am I talking about? You can leave here with this hole that you got right there filled to overflowing and it will never come back again as long as you trust him and walk with him. That right there is the most valuable possession that I have. Right there. That fullness. <laughs> I, Lord have mercy. I, this is awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't explain that, but I would, but you know, but <laughs> praise God. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1 says this. Listen to this. To everything there is a season. You, you'll, you'll recognize these verses. Maybe you didn't know they got, were got out of the Bible, taken out of the Bible. In fact, people who don't even believe the Bible quote these and don't even know where they came from. And you can almost see the Lord going, <laughs> gotcha. To everything there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to uh, build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. I, I won't even touch that one. <laughs> a time, a time, <laughs> yeah, just elbow bump, don't embrace, right? A time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, now this is the King James Version. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning of the world. Now, the Hebrew there is a little bit different than that. The Amplified Version reads this way of verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also planted eternity in men's hearts and minds. A divinely implanted sense of a purpose working through the ages, which nothing under the sun but God alone can satisfy. Yet so that men cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. 
that emptiness is a divine emptiness in this finite being, which the finite mind will never understand it because he's infinite, we're finite, but he's put eternity or the, the infinite. He put an infinite hole in everyone at birth and nothing and nobody can fill that emptiness but God. Pop all the tops for gusto all you want. You may deaden your feeling of emptiness, but it'll be back in great measure when you sober up. Pass all the laws they want to, that it's okay to get high and do whatever. Okay? But when you sober, if you ever sober up, the emptiness is still going to be there. Turn intimate relationships that God intended to be in a committed relationship between a man and woman by, bound by the vows of marriage into recreational sport. But when your one night stand is over, the emptiness you're going to have is increased because here's what happens. The more you try to fill the emptiness with anything other than God, the greater your awareness of the emptiness becomes. Uh, in high school, <laughs> in Prince George's County, Maryland, I, I played football, I ran track. I, uh, I was on the student council. I got good grades. Um, I was never turned down for a date. Where's she? Oh, hi. I'm a catch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She, I chased her till she caught me. i just leave that there, okay. <sighs> but I remember the night. It was around February of my senior year. That emptiness had been getting really, 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 really bad. I, I, <sighs> it was in the middle of the night. There was no songs. There was no preacher. There's nobody else around. I had a dream that got my attention. And in the middle of the night, rolled out of bed beside my bed, began to pray and repent. And the Lord filled me afresh with his spirit. And literally, I felt that emptiness go away. And that was February of 1964. And that emptiness has never been back again, ever. In fact, I have to remind myself what it felt like so I can understand what people are feeling that don't know that. You see, I didn't come today to practice religion. I came because I have been filled with the Spirit of the living God and he's no respecter of persons and he wants to do that for everybody here if your emptiness is not full then you're choosing to live either because you don't know and so the word ignorant doesn't mean stupid it means you just don't know you're living in ignorance or you have purposely chosen to live by your will and pay the price of being empty And, you know, we human beings, we're pretty stubborn. This stuff is stubborn stuff. And I don't know the number of people over the years that I have de dealt with, ministered to, loved on, tried to help, who were determined to prove they could be full by some other means. Determined to prove it. They were determined to prove that they could fill that emptiness through some other means other than 
the love of God. Romans 5 and 5 says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So when, I, when the, the Spirit of God comes into my life, when I become a partaker of the divine nature, when His Spirit fills that emptiness, only His eternal Spirit can fill an eternal emptiness. That is the love of God coming into my life. Now, I had the privilege of talking to a young man last night, and he was very honest with me, and it was really good, and I'm going to ask him to forgive me for preaching about him. I don't want to embarrass him at all, but he asked really good questions, and, and he said, I, I want to believe, but it's hard to believe in that which I can't see. I said, then I'm encouraging you to go out to the sky, someplace where it's dark enough to see the sky without the clouds, and ask yourself, who put those there, and why is it they're always in the exact same spot? And by what power or authority are they kept in the exact same spot? If they're there as some bogus science would want us to believe, that they're there by some explosion, then you tell me why it is that they're always in the same place. I had the opportunity. Uh, we were going from Arizona, no, excuse me, from New Mexico or Alamogordo to uh, Tucson. We were going to be in those two places. And on the way, there was an opportunity to go by the original dark sky reserve uh, in the United States. The dark sky place is the place that they have designated that you can go there and there's a very minimal amount of man-made light so that you can see the sky in its absolute beauty. And uh, we had a chance to go there one night and uh, it was just absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I, I didn't even think it would turn out, but I took a picture with my phone of uh, the area that would be called the Big Dipper and all that. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I was driving from Phoenix to uh, San Diego, and uh, uh, it was in the evening time when I got into the mountains of California. I didn't even know there were so many count mountains in Southern California between the border where Yuma is and San Diego. In fact, San Diego is mountains all the way down to the water just about. I didn't know that. I didn't remember that. I'd driven that road many, many, many years ago and completely forgot it. But when I finally crested the mountains and I was at the top going down, I looked up in the exact same stars in the exact same place were there as a couple of weeks ago in New Mexico. And I can go out tonight and here if the sky is clear and I can see those same stars. Who put them there? Who holds them in place? And then I ask this question. Are you worried about the sun coming up in the morning? No. Why? Who controls that? Then I got my app out. It's the Sunrise app. You got that? It's really cool. Sunrise and sun, uh, sunset and sunrise app. And you can go on this app and you can type, tap on location. I know I'm old, but I really, I'm pretty good at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And, you can, and I showed him, I, you could go, all I got to do is touch on a place on the map. And once I touch on that place, that becomes the location. And it will tell me, right now, it will tell me uh, what time sunset is going to be at that location. Yeah. Okay. At that location right now, I can tell you that the sunset's going to sun set at 746 in L.A. tonight. 
Last light will be at 814. First light will tomorrow morning will be at 533. And then sunrise will be at 601. But here's, here's a cool thing, okay? Let's go. I just did this one. This is fun. Let's go to somewhere in Italy. So I just marked it. I wish you could see this, but I didn't think about it in time to get it set up. So I got a place in Italy, and then it lets you go to the future. So I can go to 2036 for today's date, May the 2nd. And I can tell you that in 2036, at the spot I picked in Italy, the sun will come up at 5.31 a.m. Oh, excuse me, first light will be at 5.31 a.m. The sun will rise at 6.02 a.m. It will set at 8.10 p.m. And the last light will be at 8.41 on this app. I can do that with any spot on earth for any day of, the, of any year as far as you want to go. How does that work? I'm not talking about the app. How is it that consistent? Who controls that, that it's that consistent that we can come down to the very minute in any location when the sun will rise and set for any day in the future? Who controls that? Some cosmic accident? That would be like saying, I could take all the raw materials for making this iPad, put it in the box, in a box, and say that if I shake it long enough, out will come an iPad. And yet there are very intelligent people that believe that trash. Why? Why do they choose to believe that? They choose to believe that so they can do their own thing and not be accountable to anybody. And you know what? God lets them for now. But the bottom line is, there's a price to pay for running your own life, making your own decisions, doing your own thing, trusting your own self and not desiring to know God. Perpetual emptiness inside. Perpetual emptiness. But that's not the will of God. It's not the will of God. Now, for those who will allow it, God's going to do the miraculous today. We say, well, I don't need a miracle. (laughs) Oh, the most awesome miracle there is, everybody needs. I need it every day. And that miracle is the forgiveness of sins. Understand that the Lord didn't just say, oh, that's okay. I know you made a mistake. That's okay. Uh Uh-uh. No, 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 no. That's not what happened. And that's not what happens. The Lord does not look at you and I when we do something wrong and go, that's okay. I'll let it slide. Absolutely not. And yet because of his love, he wants to forgive every one of us. Of everything. I, I just, <laughs> it's the most amazing thing to me. I, I, I cannot conceive it. I've been preaching it for 50, almost 53 years. I've been believing it for 75 years. Even though I didn't always live according to it. I've always believed it. I always knew That in whatever condition I was in, if I sought God, He would forgive me. I mean, it's it's amazing. Forgiveness is no big deal, right? So everybody that's ever hurt you, it's no problem. Don't worry about it. It's okay, right? Forgiveness is no big deal. People mistreat you, you just say, ah, don't worry about it. It's okay. Right? Right? Oh, isn't that amazing? We don't do that. But when God offers to forgive us, we say it's no big deal. Boy, the Lord is talking to somebody here today. Wow. Wow. 
the greatest miracle there is is the forgiveness of God. I will try to be brief with this for those who have heard it a few times. But before there was anything, there was God. You know, the Big Bang Theory. Okay. Say I'm willing to accept your Big Bang Theory. I have two questions. Where did the material come from that banged? And who set off the bang? Okay. So the Big Bang Theory explains the universe and eliminates God. But the two most important questions are not even addressed. Where did the material come from to bang? You can't bang nothing and get something. You got to have something to bang. Who set it off? And man comes up with all these theories to justify doing their own thing, living their own way. And the price is emptiness. Living with an eternal size hole right here. That man does everything. You know why people do social media till they just about fall asleep at their computer or their fall asleep holding their iPad or phone or whatever it is. You know why people do that? You know why people watch Netflix till early, early in the morning till they're about to pass out? Because they can't go to sleep if they're not exhausted enough because the emptiness won't leave them alone. The emptiness won't leave them alone. I said the emptiness won't leave them alone. So in order to get any kind of sleep at all, they, they've got to get themselves totally exhausted. So whether it's social media or video games or, whatever, or, or Netflix or whatever it is. Or i got to get drunk out of my mind or high out of my mind so that I'm out of my mind so that I can finally go unconscious and call it sleep all to try to avoid acknowledging and confronting the emptiness inside here that not, doesn't let anything satisfy me nothing nothing and you know what that's why the world doesn't have a clue what the difference is between Fun and happiness. Because if you're empty, the only way you ever have relief from it is to have, for some people, is to have fun. But we all know that when what you're doing that's fun stops, the fun does there's no, the, the, the shelf life of fun is really, really short, okay? I mean, it, it, when, when the last thing you've done that is fun is finished and you're, and you're done, uh, it doesn't take long for that feeling of euphoria, fun, to go away. It doesn't last long, you see. So then I become a fun junkie. And we misname it. We call it dare devil. It's not the devil you're daring. It's God. I'm going to prove to you I can live without you and you can't do a thing about it. I'm going to prove to you that I'm in charge of my own life. You've seen the selfies. People hanging over a cliff on a, with one arm. They're not daring the devil. Climb some tower so they can take a picture. They're on, what, what, for What? See, there's fun, and then there's the adrenaline junkie. Fun for them is not good enough anymore because their emptiness has gotten so ridiculously untenable that they have to have the, 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 the endorphins of adrenaline coursing through their bodies so they jump out of airplanes for fun. And, uh, <laughs> you know, all kind of stuff, right? You know, the adrenaline junkie.
It's not that those things are necessarily wrong. It's when I use them as a substitute so I can avoid God. Why is porn the number one biggest use of the internet today? Just trying to find something to fill the hole. Just fill this emptiness. Just, just something vicariously. I talked to a man who is uh, in advanced engineering. And instead of having the virtual goggles you wear, they're working right now to use your brain as the screen and let you actually play a game in your mind. And then, of course, the next thing with that is now you can have virtual relations, physical relations with anybody uh, that you choose that's available in your mind. Man is just absolutely doing everything he can to come up with some way to find a substitute for this emptiness, but nothing lasts very long. But now happy? That's a different word, you see. Uh, let's just use, let's do, uh, I just, this is the one that just comes to mind. Uh, Matthew 5 and 6, and then go to the Amplified with that, if you would, please. And I'm really going here because the Amplified kind of gives a good definition of what the word blessed is. Uh, that's not the one I'm looking for. We'll try it. Blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness. Go back to uh, verse uh, 5. See how it does it there. There you go. Oh, here it is. Blessed, according to the Amplified, it means inwardly peaceful. Spiritually secure, worthy of respect. Go back to verse 4. Let's see how it defines it there. It gives you whatever. It, it, all of these are simply flavors of the, of the Greek word blessed. And the Amplified chose to give a different flavor on each one of them just to make an em, em, emphasis. So blessed is forgiven, refreshed by God's grace. How about verse uh, 7? Let's do verse 7. Blessed is content. Sheltered by God's promises. How about verse 8? Uh, blessed is anticipating pre God's presence, spiritually mature. Oh, why not? One more. Verse 9. Blessed is spiritually calm with life joy in God's favor. All of these are flavors of what the word blessed means. In another place, which I obviously haven't found yet and won't continue to go after, the Amplified uh, defines blessed as happy, to be envied. Happiness and being blessed of God are synonymous. Because you see, there's no way to be happy. And have an unfilled, empty hole in your heart. Not possible. You may have good times. You may have bad times. But if you are happy in God. In here. Life doesn't really change between the good times and the bad times. Because you're very well aware. There's a whole lot more to this than what the circumstances are in your life at the moment. Now, I'm not talking about emotions, okay? Even for the happiest person, they can experience joy, uh, sorrow. I can be happy and be sorrowful that I've lost my, I've lost my friend. He gained, I lost. Sean, he's in the presence of God. He gained, I lost. I can sorrow over my loss in my emotions. But that emptiness is at a level in me much deeper than the emotional level. And so I can have peace, happiness in here. Now the problem is this. This God of love who existed at one time all by himself. 
There was nothing else, no one else but God. And he desired to love and be loved. And taking a very detailed story and compacting it down to very briefly. He created the universe because of love. Because in his mind, he created a being would be similar to himself, but not God. And, but this being would be given a God-like ability, which is the power of choice. Because in order to love and be loved, there has to be a choice. It's not love if your emotions are forced on you. But if I choose to give love, then it's truly love. It's a decision first before it is a, a feeling, God's love. And so since that's what he wanted, he created all this to put man here. That sounds extremely uh, e egotistical, doesn't it, of humans to think that God did that. But he did. And it's not because we're important. It's because he's important. Because when there was nothing else but God and he loved, he was loved, how did he express love when there was no one to love? But to... But he knew when he gave man the power to choose, and he purposely chose to not interfere with that choice and never force a human being to make a choice because you can't force somebody to love you. You can't guilt them into it. You can't shame them into it. They may try, but you can't do that. Love is a choice. Thank God it's not an emotion. It Love may produce an emotion, but it's, that's, that's not love. The emotion's not love. It's the result of love. The feeling of euphoria, of belonging to someone and someone belonging to me. Other than having the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I have enjoyed that more than anything else in this world. Someone belongs to me. They claim me. <laughs> not everyone claims me. That's okay. And... There's someone that is okay with the fact I claim them. I don't own them as a possession, but she's mine. I'm hers. There's an equality in that that's beyond any other kind of equality. Because self has to be taken out of the picture to be willing to belong to someone. And when two people decide that they're going to put self aside so that they can be the missing piece for the other person's life, and that's mutually agreed upon, wow. Naturally speaking, it's the peak. It's the pinnacle. And I realize not everybody has had the privilege of experiencing that. And as my wife said today, I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for that. But I talk about these things not to make somebody feel bad that has never experienced that or doesn't have that, but so people can know that's available because the marriage in the Bible between two people as God has determined it is intended to be a living, natural example of what we can have in a much greater dimension of perspective between us and God. He wants to belong to us. He wants us to belong to him. You see, it's only servanthood if I only belong to him. He doesn't belong to me. But when the God of the, of the universe is willing to belong to me as much as I belong to him, Thomas said it. After his resurrection, Jesus said to Thomas, See here the, the scars in my hands and, and put your fingers there. Feel them. Put your hand in my side. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. My God. He's my God. He's mine. But I'm his. That's the deal, you see. That's the relationship. But the problem the Lord knew was this. That when he gave man a choice so man could choose to love him or not love him, he also knew that man would make wrong choices. And in his love, the Bible says, 
he became, in his mind, he became the Lamb of God that was slain from before the foundation of the world. So because he made the plan in advance to be able to forgive men when they did wrong, (laughs) that enabled him to love us even when we didn't love him. And his love constantly reaches for us. It's not his anger, it's his love. Constantly reaching for us. The Bible talks about be, being drawn to the Lord with bands or cords of love. It's, a, it's an invisible connection there that he, he just he, he tries to draw us to himself because he loves us and he wants us to know we're loved. And I don't always get to travel with my wife. And I have been on the other side of the globe with her, not with me. And, you know, I, I love her and she loves me. But knowing that the love God has for me is I never have to be separated from it. Ever. No matter where I am, no matter what I'm going to, through. Whether I'm sick on the point of death or Strong for my age. God's love is the same. Now, here's the problem. The Bible says that the Lord said to Adam and Eve, the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you're going to surely die. For God to be able to forgive us. Something had to die. In order for God to not violate his own word, because then he would cease to be God. In order for God to violate, not violate his own word, something had to die. Something innocent. There had never been death in the garden. And Adam being the one with oversight or dominion, the word we would see would, would understand today would be oversight. Adam had oversight over the garden. He knew all the animals. They knew him. There was no animosity between animals, no animosity between man and animals. Innocent animals had to die. And the Lord took, took the most innocent of animals, a sheep, because sheep have no natural defense mechanisms. That's why sheep have always needed to be domesticated, always needed a shepherd. Because the scripture says in Genesis 3 that the Lord took, made, the Lord made coats of skins and clothed Adam and Eve. Or he made coats of skin and gave them to Adam and Eve. They had to put them on. Where did he get the skins from? There was no death. There were no carcasses laying around that expired from age. They weren't laying around. Somebody had to die in Adam's place. The day Adam said somebody had to die. Or God would not have been true to his word if he had allowed Adam to live and said, that's okay. But then he would have been a liar If he would have done that, he couldn't just do that. And of course, I realize that this is horrifying to modern culture. But from that day in the garden until Calvary, man offered a lamb as a substitutionary sacrifice. That's why... John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. That's why when he hung on that cross, he was sinless. He was innocent. And the Bible says he took all of our sins as if they were his own. And he paid the penalty of death for those sins so that we could be forgiven. So God never goes, that's okay, I understand you made a mistake. No. No. 
The Bible says we are forgiven by his blood. We are redeemed by his blood. We are washed by his blood. We are justified by his blood. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world gave his life, shed his blood. And that shed blood is the evidence that someone took our place in death because of our sin. So, what is really easy on our end, once we have decided to believe and give ourselves to the Lord, was very costly on his end. He had to die the worst death that's ever been died. Starting with the last three verses of Isaiah 52 all the way down through the chapter of, 50, of Isaiah 53, it describes Christ as the sacrifice. Isaiah 52 says his visage, his face was marred more than any man. That's why Mary, who was one of his close disciples, did not recognize him outside the tomb. Because if the, if the nail scars were still there, if the scar in his side was still there, then the scars of his face being beat on by soldiers for over an hour, rearranging his face to the point the scripture would say that his face was going to be marred more than any man, that was all still there. He was not recognizable to them. There were scars in his feet to pay for the sins of things we, where we go we shouldn't go. Or the places we should have gone, we didn't go. There were scars, scars in his hand to pay the price for the things we've done, we shouldn't have done, and the things we didn't do, we should have done. There was a scar in his, high, in his heart for loving anything more than God. His back looked like a plowed field. To pay for all the labor we do, we do for our own goals, purposes, agendas. His head had thorn marks in it. And the thorns of Palestine grew to two to four inches long. And when they made a, a crown out of them and put him on his head and beat them into his skull with a stick. Those puncture wounds. With the price he paid for us believing we were in charge of our own life. And then finally his visage, his face was marred more than any man. If he walked in right here right now in our culture today, very few of us would be able to even look at him for more than a few moments. Because his face would be so horrible. Yes, that's right. Every painting and every statue you've seen is a lie. It's an absolute lie. But why would his face be beaten like that? Because this is where shame shines from more than any place else right here. And his face was marred to eliminate the shame in our life. He paid all those prices personally so, you, so he could say to you and I, I forgive. And the record be clean. He said he promised to forgive us of all of our sins and to remember them no more. Oh, wow. I said to the Lord one day as I was, as he and I were talking about this. I said, how is that possible? How, how do you forget when I don't forget? And if you've forgotten, why do you leave the memory with me? He said, I forget because I'm God. And I don't want to think about what, you, what I've forgiven you of every time I look at you. So I'm able to do that. But I let you remember the memory. Not to shame you. But for so you remember what my love has brought you from. What my love has done in your life. I've had this experience more than once, baptizing somebody. 
put them in the water for the moment, bringing them up. And the Spirit of the Lord come upon them, and they just rejoice in God. And many times, if they don't have the Holy Ghost, they receive it right there. And then after that all lifts eventually, and they kind of come back to themselves and realize what's just happened. I've heard them say so many times, I feel so clean inside. <laughs> yeah. That's what Paul said Ananias told him after he had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus. Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. Washed. Clean. 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 John said in 1 John 1, If we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth's not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And anybody that is of the opinion that Christians never sin, that you don't read the Bible, do you? This, this totally sincere young man I was talking to last night, he said, but I don't know how I can live perfect. And I said, that's a lie. There's no place in the Bible that says we're supposed to be perfect. I know the King James uses the word perfect, but the Greek there does not mean flawless or mistake-free. The word perfect means you have grown up and become mature in God. That's what the Greek word means. In fact, why would God say to those in the church, 1 John chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, we're liars and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If his purpose or his expectation is for me to be perfect and never make a mistake. And I've said this many times. My only worthiness in standing before you today and holding this microphone and saying these things to you does not come from my goodness from my perfection, it comes from the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that gives me the right to stand here and talk to you like this. Not only the blood, but my experience with the blood. And knowing that my goodness does not come from me, it comes from His love washing me daily by His blood. And the world saying, well, you Christians are weak because you need a God to depend on. <laughs> That's, that is so ridiculous. So we're weak that we don't want to deal with guilt. We're weak that we don't want to live a life full of shame. We're weak because we don't want perpetual emptiness in our life that's driving us to do things we don't really want to do, but we're we just got to find some relief to this emptiness. We're weak. Let me tell you something right now. <laughs> In our world today, anybody that's a true Christian and stands up for what they believe the Bible says is some of the bravest, strongest people you will ever meet. Because in this country, it has now become not just unpopular, but being a Christian, a biblical Christian, has opened the door for you being labeled every kind of odious term. And if you don't think that's true, wait a few weeks or months and you will see it. It's already in the news, you see. <laughs> On ESPN, and I'm not endorsing Oral Roberts University. I'm just repeating what happened. When Oral Roberts University made the NCAA men's basketball tournament a uh, well-known commentator on ESPN said they shouldn't even be allowed in the tournament because of their hatred. And what was their hatred? I just believe the Bible. And the Bible is contrary to current culture's dogma. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And 
There was virtually no one that really called her down for that. No, no, no. She was applauded. Uh, if you really believe the Bible, you can't hide it. Sorry. You can say you're a Christian, but that doesn't mean you believe the Bible. Years ago, in fact, it was 1980, we were having a major time of revival, and we, uh, we had an opportunity to go, and we got a room in the Student Union at the University of Maryland, and we were talking about the Lord. And uh, <laughs> there was a young man came and sat there. He said, I believe in Jesus, but don't believe in the Bible. At the time, I was shocked by that. I'm not shocked by that anymore today. There's, that is far more prevalent in Christianity than today than there is those who truly believe the Bible is the word of God and is the final authority in their life. There are many, many more Christians today who believe in Jesus but don't believe in the authority of the Bible is the word of God. True. I'm not just throwing that out there. <laughs> just go start asking the question. And I said to him, I I'm sorry, I'm confused. I don't understand how you can believe in Jesus and not believe in the Bible. The Bible is what is the one that tells us who and what Jesus was, what he stood for, what he believed, all of that. He sa I said, if you don't believe the Bible, how do you know what Jesus is? He said, I just make him whatever I want him to be. What an honest man. There's so many others that do that that would never openly admit it. Well, I just make him who and what I want him to be. What I think he should be. Well, that would be like me walking up to you and saying, uh, uh, you're an astronaut. I want you to get me a ride on the shuttle. And you go, what are you talking about? I'm no astronaut. Yeah, I believe you're an astronaut. I think you can get me a ride on the shuttle. Are you kidding me? No, I've determined I believe you're an astronaut. That's what I need you to be because I want to ride on the shuttle. And because I know you're an astronaut, I'm asking you to use your power as an astronaut, your influence, to get me a ride on the shuttle. And you're looking at me like I'm absolutely crazy. So you're made up God. You can expect him to do all kind of stuff that you think he ought to be able to do, but... Not happening. It's not happening. The Bible says if we deny him, he abideth or remaineth true to himself. He cannot deny himself. I can refuse to believe him, but he can, he's not going to refuse to believe in himself. And Paul said another place, he said, uh, what if some did not believe? Does that make the faith of God without effect? Nay, let God be true, but every man a liar. So what are you going to do with this? Are you willing to leave here with your, the slate of your life completely wiped clean? You know, even, even medical science agrees that we are shaped by our past. Babies aren't born skeptical. Babies aren't born cynical. Babies aren't born not believing or trusting in anybody. We teach them how to do that. We make promises we don't keep. And we correct them by making threats we don't follow up on. We teach children not to believe adults. And then we grow up into adults that don't trust other people, don't trust ourselves. And then we raise children and teach them not to trust. We're not born that way. 
I mean, there's nobody with faith like a three-year-old that you promise something to. Nobody. Nobody's got faith like a three-year-old that you promise something to. You make a promise to a kid. You tell them what you're going to do when you're going to do it. You will be reminded of that with, with it spoken in absolute certainty. That you're going to do what you said. But then we get busy. We find excuses. We don't do what we said we were going to do. And we teach that child, you can't trust me. You can't trust my word. Because it's better to never make a promise to a child than it is to make one and not keep it. And is there anybody sitting here that never experienced that in your life? Nah, there's not one of us sitting here that didn't experience feeling like we were lied to because we were promised something that didn't happen. Not one of us. So that's the point, you see. What are we going to do about it? The Lord expects what he, he's done, that he is faithful with every day to encourage our trust. How many of you prayed before you went to bed last night, now, Lord, please be merciful on us and let the sun come up in the morning? Nobody? Did, how many of you did it cross your mind, I hope the sun comes up in the morning? Oh. So you may not be acknowledging that you're trusting God to do that, but we've already demonstrated the fact that if it is a random body with no outside force working on it, it can't be that predictable, that much in control. At the Naval Academy, I had a whole semester in celestial navigation. Because until GPS, which hasn't been that long ago, that it was really trusted, the only way you get from one side of an ocean to another is because the stars are exactly where they're supposed to be. And your relationship to those stars on a chart tells you exactly where you are. Who controls all of that? So while man teaches us not to trust, God teaches us, always teaches us to trust him. You know how many people that can't call God father because of their bad relationship with their father? Do you know how many second marriages, more second marriages end up divorced than first marriages? Because people bring the problems and pain into their second marriage and judge their new spouse by that. And finally, that spouse decides, this isn't very fair that you are making me pay for the decisions and the choices and the treatment from somebody else. And so, the, forget this, I'm out of here. And yet there's a God that will enable you to leave here different today. Free from your sins, healed, whole, if you'll allow it. And the first step in all of that is to ask him to forgive you. We're going to do that right now where you're sitting. We're going to take this time and give you the opportunity to do that if you choose. I know this has been very different than what some of you are used to. Okay, next Sunday you come back, it won't be like this. They'll do what they feel led, led of God to do then. This is what I've been directed to do. Some of you have repented of things over and over and over again, but you've never let God forgive you. You've never let God wipe away all of that guilt over that sin he wants to do that he wants to do that we ask him to forgive us 
but we struggle to believe that he can and will. Well, trust me, if you walk out of here unforgiven, it won't be because it's not his will. If you walk out of here unforgiven, it won't be because it's his choice. He's already done everything possible to do to prove to you that he not only is able to forgive you, but he's willing to forgive you because he died on the cross in your place. He didn't ask me to die on that cross. And he spares me from eternal death. But I have to choose to believe that or not believe that. Receive that or not receive that. And he cannot violate your will. We've all made choices that we wish we could undo the consequences of. We've all made choices that, that or there were choices we didn't make, we wish we'd have made, that we, we carry guilt or shame over. It is not the will of God for you to live a life with any guilt inside. He died on the cross to take away your guilt. But he cannot take away your guilt against your will. You have to, with faith, ask him to forgive you. Let's do that if you choose. You don't have to pray. But if, you, if you're confessing or asking for forgiveness of your sins, you have to ask. You have to speak it. It may be a whisper so no one around you can hear. That's fine. But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you want to be forgiven, you have to speak it. You don't have to give the gory details of sitting here. You know, that's, nobody's trying to embarrass you. This is between you and God. I can't hear you. I don't want to hear you. We have a right to have our sins kept secret between us and God. The scripture says, Psalms 32 and 1, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The Lord wants to cover our sins, our forgiven sins, so that we don't walk around with a badge saying, Look what I've done, what I used to be. The world says if you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. If you're a drug addict, you're always a drug addict. If you're an abuser, you're always an abuser. But the scripture says that God is able to take all of that away and make you new. You can leave here free today. Your choice. There's only one way to be free, and that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Are you going to let him forgive you? Oh, what you're feeling in this place right now is the manifestation of the love of God. He's so gentle. He's so gentle. He's touching you so gently. That's I him. That's his spirit. Come on. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. He wants your sins to be gone. He wants to take the regret away. He wants to take the regret, regret away so that you're, you're free from the past. Can you can't have hope for the future while you have guilt and shame over your past. Let his blood cover your past. Don't be a prisoner of your past. Don't let your past try to determine what you are now or in the future. Only the blood of Jesus only the name of Jesus, only the Spirit of God can empower you so that you're free. Church can't do that. Religion can't do that. No preacher, no man can do that. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. I Some are raised in the church. They've made mistakes. They've gone out trying to come back and, and can't get rid of all the regret for what they've done. That's not the will of God. It's the will of God for you to let him forgive you. But I knew I was doing wrong. Yes, I understand that. We've all made wrong choices even when we knew they were wrong choices. But his love reaches to you today and say, let me forgive you. I don't want you living in the past. I don't want you believing that when I look at you, that's all I see is your past. Come on. Come on. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. This is right. This is between you and God, right where you are. 
no. It's not about the person on either side of you, the person in front of you, behind you. It's not about the fact that you're in a church service. It's not about that. It's about the fact that the love of God has spoken the word of God to you. And now the spirit of God is drawing you and encouraging you to trust him. Trust his love. Trust his motives. His, the, his motives is his love. Trust him. Let him do for you. He wants you to have a brand new life. He died on the cross so you can have a new life. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're young or older than me. The Lord is still interested, still willing, still desires to free you from all of your guilt. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to receive it. He cannot force it on you. All he can do is offer it to you. What you do with it is up to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can make me in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus now some of you over the years including today you've really tried to repent but you just don't feel all that different and you don't know why because the scripture says if we don't let his love, His blood help us to forgive those that have offended us, then we choose for Him not to forgive us. But Brother Wright, you don't know what they've done to me. No, I don't. And you have a right to keep that private. But the bottom line is, who's the prisoner of what they've done, them or you? Who's in bondage and tormented by what they've done, them or you? Forgiveness does not release them so that God... It's not you saying to God, it's okay what they did. It's you saying to God, I give them and what they did to you. Whatever you choose to do with them is your business, not mine. I want to be free from it. And there are some of you precious people been coming here for years. And you've said the words or tried to, I forgive, but you meant that while you were in the service, but somewhere, some level of your subconsciously you, consciousness, you took all those wounds with you, took them all home with you. You took all that pain home with you. You took all the memories of what, the, what they did to you, and you're in bondage to it. You're in bondage. You're in bondage. You really want to be free? You've heard the old saying, having an offense or a grudge is like drinking poison and expecting the person that did you wrong to die. That's not original with me by a long shot, but it is absolutely the truth. It's time to be free, isn't it? Isn't it time? And you'll know you've forgiven when all the feelings, emotions, when their name doesn't push a button in your memory and cause something to rise up, you'll know you've forgiven. That's the will of God. You're free. You're free. While I, while I have a grudge, you can accidentally touch that button, that wound inside of me and cause me to react. And I may not even know why I'm reacting because I kept that wound and you've accidentally, with, without knowing it, touched that wound and I react. That makes me I'm not free. I'm a slave to all of those who accidentally or otherwise touch that wound. Or I sometimes call it, not trying to be facetious, a button. Because people have buttons. What does this button do? Well, when you forgive, you get rid of the buttons. That means you're now the one that determines your reactions. Because when you have wounds or a button... Somebody can treat you in a way on purpose or without even knowing what they're doing and touch that wound and all of a sudden that you, you're reacting and you don't even know why sometimes you're reacting like that. It's because you've left the wound undealt with, the offense. It's time to give it to God. Come on, right now. Father, by your grace, because you love me, 
I receive your, your, your help to forgive the person that's wronged me. I give it all to you. I don't want to be a prisoner to it anymore, Lord. I don't want to be bound by it anymore. Lord, I'm not saying what they did was okay. I'm just saying I want to trust you with it rather than me trying to play God and exacting vengeance. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Unforgiveness is always an act of vengeance against the person that wronged you. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Don't you want to go home different today? Don't you want to get up tomorrow morning different? Don't you want to know that you're finally free? Free from your own past, your own decisions, but also free from the consequences of other people's decisions and other people's choices that have left marks upon you that you're still affected by. I want to be who God wants me to be. I don't want to be who my experiences have made me to be. I don't want to be what what I've allowed other people's treatment of me to make me to be. Come on. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. Some of you have repented of your sins, but you don't really feel free. Here's why. You can't ask the Lord to forgive you of what you've done against Him without forgiving those that have done whatever they've done against you. It's a package deal, friend. Come on. Come on. The Lord wants you to go home new. The Lord wants you to go home fresh. Come on. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it time to be free Isn't it time to be able to enjoy the fullness of the Spirit? Isn't it time to be able to be spiritually and emotionally happy because you're free? Free. Free. In Jesus' name. Because here's the problem. When you carry offenses, you exact vengeance. You don't realize you're doing it, but you make decisions that's going to disappoint or hurt the person that's offended you. Because when you make decisions they don't agree with, it's your way of paying them back. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Lord wants us to be whole. The Lord wants us to be free. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on. I cannot do this to you or for you. All I can do is follow the Holy Ghost and give you the opportunity to allow Him to do it for you. To allow Him to empower you to do it. Come on. In the name of Jesus, be free. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be whole. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I loose the spirit of grace, the spirit of the love of God, the spirit of the power of God upon every one of us in this place today and everyone that's watching today, that you might allow the Spirit of the Lord to empower you to let His blood change you and make you whole. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Lord loves you, but you're not going to feel love unless you, ex- you let Him love you. He's offering you, you His love, but you're not going to feel love unless you receive that love. And yes, to receive that love, I have to receive it on His terms. That means I believe and receive what He's done for me, what He's given to me. That, believe, that means I believe that he loves that person that's wronged me just as much as he loves me. And I let them go. I don't hold them hostage to what they've done to me anymore. I don't punish them anymore for what they've done to me. I let God have it and He let him be in control of it. And I'm free. 
In the name of Jesus. 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 There's a lot of people living lives and doing things that's not really their desire, but they can't help themselves. Not because the devil's making them do something, but because of all that stuff going on down inside of them makes them so dissatisfied and so restless that just feel driven to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Trying somehow to find out how to get fixed. Trying somehow to find out how to, 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 to fix this thing that's going on inside of them that they feel trapped by and can't be free from. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. See, that's between the difference between this current culture and the Word of God. The current culture says, you are you, you are, just get, get used to it. That's just who you are. Too bad. You're that forever. You've got no hope of being any different. But the Word of God says that He is able to set me free. He is able to make me who He wants me to be. A person that I can love. A person I can feel has worth. A person that I can feel is of value to God, therefore to others. In the name of Jesus. 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 And while you're doing that, let's go that one more step. Some of you can't allow yourself to be loved because you hate yourself. I was molested when I was five years old. I spent 33 years hating myself, even though I was trying to be a Christian. I spent 33 years not even knowing what was wrong with me. On my good days, I didn't like myself. On my bad days, I hated myself. And those feelings, they dictated my actions too many times. And as strange as it sounds, as strange as it sounds, I could not be free till I let the Lord help me to forgive myself. I had no basis on my own to forgive myself. Telling myself it was okay, it's no big deal, it just you were just a child. All of that, that never worked. It didn't fix anything. But when the Lord Jesus Christ, by His love, enabled me to finally, I prayed something similar to this, Lord, by Your help and grace, I forgive and release myself for, and I filled in the blank. And I just began to say that for everything I used to beat myself up for. Nobody here beats themselves up over stuff, do we? Nah. No. Oh, yeah, we do. Isn't it time to be free from that? It is not the will of God for you to live like that. It's not the will of God. I don't care how much medical science says it's normal. Yeah, it's normal. That's the way humans live without God. But it's not the will of God. I went 33 years with so much shame, I lived in terror of anybody finding out what, happened, what, ha what had happened to me. And I don't have the time today to go into the full story. But I've told the story of me being molested and what God did for me to thousands and thousands of people since February of 1984 with no shame. And I've watched people helped because He helped me. Freely I received, I'm freely given. It's bad enough when you've got sins that you can't believe are forgiven. It's worse when you've got things that people have done for you, against you, that you just can't let go of. But the worst grudge in the world is the grudge of self-blame, beating yourself up. Oh, I don't have that, really. So when you do something that you think was stupid, you don't say stuff to you that you wouldn't let anybody else say to you, huh? Boy, I could 
curse myself without ever using a word of profanity. My most used words were, you stupid idiot, what is wrong with you? You will, can't you ever do anything right? What is your problem? You're hopeless. Nobody ever said anything like that to themselves when you've done something you wish you hadn't have done? Oh, yeah, right. Well, let me tell you where that comes from, and let me tell you why it can't go away until you let the Lord Jesus Christ forgive you. It comes from the accuser. And we repeat what he says to us about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Adam and Eve committed sin. They hid from God. The Lord said to, them, to, to him, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? I'm afraid. Why are you afraid? I'm naked. And the Lord said, who told you you were naked? Who? That voice that speaks to your head when you've done something and that you repeat, you stupid idiot, you are hopeless. What is wrong with you? You will never get anything right. You, and, and, you, and every time you make a promise to God, you lie. You know you're lying. You know you can't keep it. You're just lying. Never heard those thoughts before? Worse yet, never repeated them? Anything like that? Come on, right now. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will allow him. It was a short prayer prayed when I finally understood what was wrong. That the Lord empowered me to be free. And I've been free since February of 84. I love me. But I don't love me with my human love. The love that God gives me, His love for me is the love that gives me worth. Because He loves me, it proves how much I'm worth. I have worth because He hung on a cross for me. He loves me. But I've got to let all that stuff go. All that regret, all that disappointment in myself, all that self-blame, all that rejection, all that feeling, those feelings of failure... I've got to let all that go. I've got to give it to God. I've got to be free. Come on. Right now, I can't, I, I, you know, I know you're, it's getting close to noon and some of you are ready to go. Okay, fine, go. But God is trying to change some lives here today. The Lord's trying to set some people free right here, right now. This changed my life. It changed my life. It made me a new person. No more baggage. No more guilt. No more shame. I was free. Now in those days that I do something I shouldn't do or something I should have done I didn't do, I'm able to quickly ask Him to forgive me and believe that He does. And so I don't wallow in my humanity and its faults. I just keep on going because He sets me free. Come on. In Jesus' name, one more moment here. Out of respect to others, whether you pray or not, think about dinner. I don't care what you think about. That's between you and God. But could we bow our heads and close your eyes and give people around you the freedom to pray this in private, to pray this privately in Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command the wounds of these lives to be healed. I command this shame to be purged from these lives and hearts. Be free in Jesus' name. Be free. Be free. I command you to be, be set free in Jesus' name. I command you to be made whole or be healed in Jesus' name. I command you to be whole in Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. The spirit of fear of failure and the spirit of fear of rejection, the adversary uses to, to bind us, to paralyze us. God wants you to be free. There may be days I fail. There may be times that people reject me. But that's their problem. It's not my problem. I don't, I don't have any obligation to let them put that on me. I'm free. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. What's t- what God is doing today is the most miraculous thing you will ever experience. It's the most supernatural thing you will ever experience yes. because Jesus. only the Lord can do this for us. Only the Lord can do this for us. We cannot do this for ourselves. There's no medication that will fix these things. There's no medication that will fix these things. My soul. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can make us whole. Come on. Something Be free in Jesus' name. Be free in Jesus' name. Come on. I know you may be sitting with your husband or your wife. If you believe they love you, then why don't you put them out of your mind long enough to let God help you. It'll make you a better husband. It'll make you a better wife. It'll make your marriage happier if you're not carrying all this baggage. Oh, he touched me. If you're carrying all this baggage, you'll never have a happy marriage. Some of you are divorced today because of the baggage you carried in your marriage. Come on. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't know why you're treating your husband like that. You don't know why you're treating your wife like that. You don't understand why am I, why am I treating them like that? Why am I reacting like that? Because it's stuff you're holding on to. The Lord wants to set you free from so that your, your actions toward that person you love can be actions of love, not actions of hurt. Let me tell you what shame does. Shame says to me, I'm going to reject you before you can reject me. I'm going to reject you before you can reject me. I'm going to hurt you before you can hurt me. That's no way to have a life. That's no way to be married. That's no way to be a Christian. That's bondage. It's torment. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Go ahead. Jesus' name. Just another couple of moments, please. Their lives being completely changed today. Come on. Their lives that are changing today because of the love of God, because of the power of God, because of the grace of God. There are lives changing today. You may walk out of here and say, I don't feel any different. Just give the Lord a couple of hours, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden one day you're going to just kind of come to yourself and go, wow, this is different. This is not the way I've reacted before. This is not the way I've lived before. This is not the way I've thought before. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, And the closer a person is to us, the deeper they can hurt us. If I don't know you at all, you don't know me at all, you might hurt me, but it's it's, going to be a a flesh wound. It's not going to be very deep. But the more I love you, the more I care about you, the more you're important to me, the deeper you can hurt me. And the harder it is for me to let those things go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Father, I commit the work of your word and your spirit into your hands today. You have planted the seed of love and the seed of faith, the seed of healing and wholeness, the seed of deliverance, the seed of freedom in the hearts and lives of those that have received this word today. I'm trusting you with that word, Father. I'm trusting you to work that word in these lives to your glory, to your honor, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God.